So, hi, um, I'm John from uh, Facebook's London security team, where I work on um, some privacy preserving products, and uh, primarily end-to-end -end encryption in Messenger. So this is something that we built um, and launched in July 2016, um, and we call it Secret Conversations, which um, enables you to talk end-to-end -end encrypted between one device of yours and then one of the recipient of these messages with optional ephemerality as well. So in this talk, I'm going to give a bit of an overview of why this feature looks the way it does, um, and then take a, look, a, look, a deeper look into some of the cryptography uh, that we chose. So to first just frame this discussion, let's start with a higher level model of how regular message conversations work. So first and foremost, Messenger is indexed by your Facebook account. So as opposed to many messaging systems where you might be uh, talking to essentially a phone number, with Facebook you're talking to an identity, a name, a profile picture, a friend graph. And this is an identity that's cloud-based. It's administered by Facebook, essentially, and uh, it's accessible across all of your devices. You can log on anywhere um, to access Messenger from your smartphone, your laptop, your friend's laptop, an internet cafe, um, an old feature phone, and you'll have all of your message history available. Um, so a totally valid use case is you've forgotten your computer and you log on on your friends, you want to check your messages. Which leads me to the final point of this model where devices can be shared between people. Um, so this is particularly notable with web browsers. Uh, but also our mobile apps, say in Android, you're able to switch between different users too. So with that as a sort of overall model of how Messenger tends to look, let's look at what an E2E Messenger would typically offer. So first and foremost, um, you wouldn't really be E2E if the provider could read your messages. Um, it would completely defeat the object. You ideally want forward secrecy um, to make sure, of course, if your keys are compromised at some point or your overall device state, um, that early, earlier messages don't leak. Um, ideally, you'd also have future secrecy so that um, you can be safe post-compromise as well. You want to be able to verify that the person you're talking to truly is who you think they are. Um, it's not that much use having an in encrypted connection to someone if you don't know who the other endpoint is. And then a slightly subtler point is that you want to make sure if your device is shared that only the person using the device at the time or the person who's meant to be using the device at the time uh, messages are available and anyone else who may have used that device at some other point, uh, their, their messages still remain secure. So with this sort of list of prerequisites for what we'd want from an E2E map, how would we expect this to look at a sort of slightly higher level? Well, to start with, you've got to have a well-defined set of endpoints. Um, if you're messaging someone, you, E2E, you've got to know which keys you're encrypting to. You've got to have some level of consistency in identity so that you know that, say, if you checked someone's key yesterday, you're still messaging the same person. If it's constantly changing, then that's uh, not as um, useful, because again, you could just be swapped out and talking to some completely different man in the middle. You're not gonna be able to have message history in a reliable manner. Um, so if you switch to a new device, um, we, we couldn't find any way to really marry this with perfect forward secrecy and still ha reliably have your message history av available. And this one sort of goes without saying, but you, your client needs to be able to encrypt and store crypto state and, and messaging data. So this excludes, for example, some basic browsers without JavaScript support. And finally, um, because you might have shared devices, um, you're gonna need some mechanism by which to protect um, the data from one account from another account on, on, a, on a shared device. 
There are a bunch of apps out there which already fit this model. Uh, WhatsApp, Signal, and Viber are some of the most obvious ones. Uh, Allo is also pretty close. And uh, notably, these are all indexed by your phone number. So this already provides that well-defined set of endpoints that you need. Um, they do have some sort of model of secondary device, each of them, but um, they're somehow all, they all share the same identity still. So this consistently verifiable identity isn't broken. And you've still got message history not being available when you use a new device. Then also these clients are all apps provided by the vendor so they can make sure that this binary has the necessary crypto, the necessary storage capabilities in. But Messenger really doesn't fit this model at all. Um, the endpoints will constantly change but still have full message history. Um, we've got messaging over a number of services, including ones which don't support JavaScript on our mo basic mobile site. So as we want to add end-to-end -end encryption, one option is to try and do this by default and in doing so, totally change the product and actually remove a bunch of features that people use Messenger for, um, a lot of the things that people rely on. Or we can build it as an optional mode and not force people to use it. And this is, of course, what we did. So with, this is the model for Messenger and um, how we were going to take this forward. Let's take a look at some of the high-level choices. The, as there were still many degrees of freedom in how this can look. So from the start, we wanted to use off-the-shelf crypto. Um, we didn't want to roll our own where we could avoid it. And there is a small aspect in the message franking which is slightly novel, and I'll cover that later, but in general, we were using off-the-shelf tools. Um, one of the earlier decisions we made was, had to make was how many devices could be in any given thread. Uh, so we knew from the start that it would have to be a subset of devices for Messenger, because there are always some, particularly the no JavaScript versions, which won't have access to secret conversations. So we had to have some sort of device management model. Um, Multi-device in this world would be somewhat complex to come up with and potentially more difficult for a user to understand. So we ended up just saying each thread has one device per person in. Uh, very simple to understand uh, what's going on. And also somewhat simplifies the engineering um, as in general, the multi-device protocols that we could use would bootstrap off a one-to-one -one protocol. So we'd have to have created this one-to-one -one version in the first place. So with one device per thread, per person, um, the next option is, well, is that your only device that you can use for all secret conversations, or can you actually use different devices for different threads? And we did actually experiment with the latter model a bit, but this, this ended up adding extra complications. For starters, to get this well-defined set of endpoints, you now actually had to have a symmetric setup. Sorry, not, not symmetric, synchronous. Um, so I actually send a request from my device, which defi well defines which device I'm using, but I don't know which you are until you respond. Um, so this was a far less good user experience, and so we ended up going with the single device per account, which, meaning the, your, your model is really simple, particularly with the previous point, that any device that you can use for secret conversations is, is the only one that you can use for secret conversations. Uh, you know exactly who you're messaging, you know exactly where your messages are going. Then finally, we had to decide which services we're going to support. Uh, here we just went for our main apps, so iOS and Android. Um, web presents a number of challenges, not least trust in the JavaScript cryptography, and we didn't want to address this in the initial version. So that's what we aim to build. Uh, let's take a look into some of the deeper specifics of the crypto. So the first main decision was what end-to-end -end protocol should we use? And we quickly settled on the signal protocol here, or the axolotl ratchet at the time that we started designing this. And pretty much because this is the best in class. It's what WhatsApp's using, Signal, of course, uh, Google Allo, uh, Viber, I think, with their own implementation. So it's pretty much an industry standard. I won't go too deeply into this, as I think there are two talks on this protocol later on. 
Um, but suffice to say, it's really good. Another feature that we wanted to support was abuse reporting. Um, so we care a lot about people feeling safe on Facebook, um, meaning that having an ability to address abusive behavior in some degree is, is important for us to maintain. So in an end-to-end -end encrypted model, um, this is much more limited compared to channels where we do have the plain text available. But we did want people to at least be able to report these messages to us. Now, naively, you could have a simple model where when Alice sends something to Bob over the encrypted channel, in this diagram denoted just by the, the green channel, um, Bob sends it up to Facebook saying, this is what Alice sent me. But the problem here is that we've no way of verifying that Bob's being honest. Because because uh, we're not st permanently storing the ciphertext server-side um, just during the delivery process, and we didn't want Bob to have to store this either. So we ended up building a mechanism that we called message franking, which allows us to verify that messages truly were sent over our infrastructure as claimed, but without leaking the message contents to us unless um, they are explicitly reporting, and without us having to store anything about this server-side. Um, so I'll cover this more deeply in the next few slides if um, this diagram isn't particularly clear. But so at a high level, you've got Alice is adding an HMAC over her contents, uh, over her plain text to be sent up to Facebook. And then we add our own HMAC on top of this so that when Bob, Bob reports it, we have enough data to verify that the plain text that he sent um, is... Um, matches what Alice sent him because of the HMAC, and we can verify that the HMAC truly was accurate because of the one that we added. So Alice has to send a message, let's call this M, and she, she generates a random nonce and appends this to the message or contains it within the message structure. Um, she then generates an HMAC over this, which we're gonna call the franking tag. Um, keyed with this random nonce. Um, then encrypts the structure containing the message and the nonce uh, using libsignal and sends up to Facebook. I'm gonna send this message to Bob, here's the franking tag, and here's the ciphertext. Um, on our end, we compute what we call the authentication tag, which is an HMAC over this franking tag combined with some basic metadata. So it went from Alice to Bob at this time. And then we forward all of this to Bob. Um, so that it came from Alice, here's Alice's franking tag, here's our authentication tag, and here's the actual ciphertext. On Bob's side, he ignores the authentication tag, because this is meaningless to him, because he doesn't have Facebook's secret key. But having decrypted the, the ciphertext from Alice, is able to verify that Alice was honest with the franking tag, because he has both the plain text and the secret nonce. And then this verification ensures that the authentication tag that Facebook has sent is computed over the correct data because he knows that Alice was honest in her initial franking tag. So if Bob then wants to report the message, um, he just needs to send the plain text up um, with the original nonce, the timestamp, the fact that it came from Alice, and then this authentication tag which we can receive <coughs> from this. We can recompute the franking tag and then recompute the authentication tag, verify that it was correct, and then we've now proved that it truly was sent from Alice to Bob at the same time that we thought, and we've got a similar level of assurance on this as with any normal message sent over Messenger um, in plain text in our regular mode. So next we have a mechanism to send attachments. Um, we used a separate data store for attachment data rather than inlining this within the signal protocol. Um, as this better suited the messaging transport that we're using and gave shorter latency. So here's a diagram of how this works and the next slide will again cover this slightly more clearly. Um, but you're generating a random key alongside the, Im the image, you're encrypting it, <coughs> using the conceal library if you're on Android or a re-implementation of the same protocol um, if you're on iOS. Then this ciphertext is being uploaded to Facebook, stored for 30 days in our backend, um, and Facebook returns to us an ID, an authentication string for us to download it later on. 
Um, we also then include in the message packet uh, this key that decrypts the message, a checksum of the ciphertext, and potentially a thumbnail of the image uh, to improve the UX um, on the initial delivery. Um, so here's it laid out. Um, I think I've pretty much covered, covered that, so I'll just leave that up for a sec. And um, I'd, I'd note here that this authentication string alongside the ID is just there to prevent people from scraping through the attachment ID space um, so that they can't just iterate over it until they find random ciphertexts to download, uh, which should be meaningless to them because they're ciphertexts, but we wanted to avoid that anyway. And so the receive path here is fairly simple. You've, uh, you decrypt your ciphertext, giving you the thumbnail, the key, um, the ID, the authentication string, and the checksum. You display this thumbnail, you download the ciphertext, check, check the checksum, decrypt it, display it. So finally, we wanted to address this shared device issue that we have um, and protect the on-device secret conversations database when you might be logged out. Um, so this is partly because good practice for sensitive data being stored, but uh, largely motivated, motivated by the, this shared device model. So to isolate data between users, we simply provide, an, we provide a key from Facebook at the point of login, um, and then we store all of our secret conversations database for a given user under that key. Um, and then as soon as you log out, it's wiped from memory on the phone, so you don't have access to it anymore. Um, this looks roughly like this, um, each arrow donating a layer of encryption. Um, so you've got a storage key on the device, which is encrypted by this server-provided key from Facebook. Uh, that stores first your private keys, so your lip signal identity key, your signed pre-key, etc., and also your thread storage keys, each thread being encrypted under a separate key, which then contains the messaging data and the session keys for that thread. So that's the product, let's, and why it looks as it does. Let's finish up with just some of the challenges we're looking into and hoping to get good solutions for in future, and which this community may have some thoughts on. So a huge one here is that of actually authenticating your peers. Um, we wanted to be able to provide some simple model whereby you can trust the person you're talking to truly is who they claim to be. Um, this is our current solution. Um, it's uh, probably a fairly f familiar type of screen to most people, so you can just compare your public identity keys with people, but we're fully aware that the vast majority of people won't do this. Um, so we want Alice to really be able to verify that she's truly talking to Bob without this having specialist knowledge, without knowing that you need to go check your keys, without having sort of any certificate authority. And ideally come up with this sort of UX that browsers have sort of perfected, well, maybe not perfected yet, but uh, <laughs> browsers are doing pretty well on with TLS and require very lit little knowledge from the actual user. Next, uh, we would like to extend this feature beyond a single device per account to, multi to support multiple devices um, to better reflect how regular messenger is used by many people. Um, so our current model is really quite simple and very easy to understand. This is your secret conversations device. This is your identity key. You can message someone else's designated device compare with their identity key and you know exactly where the channel for these messages is. But we'd like to remove this restriction. Um, there are engineering challenges there, but ultimately we had some higher level UX concerns. Um, so we, we've got to manage how devices get enrolled for your account, um, how they then get subsequently disenrolled, um, whether this disenrollment can happen automatically at some point and how that will affect the overall experience. Because of course, you don't want pe people again to have to understand how all the crypto works in real life, and so they shouldn't have to know that they need to disenroll a device at some point. 
and also once you're dealing with multiple devices, it makes the authentication problem trickier. Um, so you're no longer verifying a single key, but you could be verifying a collection of keys for a given account, uh, and a collection which is more likely to change more frequently. So a common option used in multi-party chat, uh, such as with WhatsApp and Signal, is conversation codes, which provides a fingerprint over all participants of the thread. Um, but in our case, we feel it's not quite that simple as that relies on you knowing that you have all, this, uh, all of the devices within the thread. So when, you, when you're comparing, um, this is this phone number, this is this phone number, and this one, and between them, we know that there are three devices in this thread, and we can see all three are sharing the same key, you know that that's okay. But for us, if you're unlikely to have a large number of all of your devices in the same place at once, verifying that you share the same key isn't sufficient as you don't know how many other people out there share the same key as you. Well, people, devices, sorry. So it's probably not the, a complete solution for us. And then finally, I've said that we, we didn't want to address this initially, but we would eventually like to add web support. Now, this compounds the multi-device concerns significantly as with web sessions you're more likely to have many more of them um, over time. You're much more likely to say be logging in in incognito mode in your browser in very frequently as opposed to logging in on your phone once and leaving it there until you get a new phone. So this means there'll be a lot, lot many more keys on any device. It uh, risks potentially scaling issues particularly with client-side computation and then compounds this problem of, well, how do we disenroll these devices? Um, particularly given that with lots of sing single-use browsing sessions, there's a risk of forward secrecy that suddenly you're creating a lot of states out there which are cap need to be capable of decrypting all future conversations until, um, until that device is disenrolled. And then finally, um, we have to overcome the general trust issues with uh, JavaScript crypto being provided by a remote provider and potentially changed every web request and how can you trust that this code is actually uh, correct and it's an unsolved problem as far as I'm aware. Um, this is fundamentally different from our mobile apps where we're actually serving a binary through a third party and you've got a pretty good um, idea that you're seeing the same binary that everyone else in the world is. So it's a big difference there. Um, that's all I've got. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, I'm not sure if I have time for questions. But, uh, yeah, we, can take, we can take one or two questions. Oh, great. So, uh, the end-to-end -end encryption is protecting against wiretapping. It doesn't protect against surveillance, uh, which is like who is talking to who. So if Facebook doesn't add end-to-end -end encryption, right, uh, people then know that it's not good to say, to talk to a journalist over Facebook. So they will self-censor and instead will use signal that doesn't collect metadata, as we know from the documents from the court, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe, why guys you bother and adding end to end? Like, I mean, honestly, it will just, people will get in trouble. So, yes, as, as you've observed, protecting metadata wasn't really part of our overall model. Um, it's um, very difficult to achieve within, um, within our world and we get a lot of benefits from, from it, for example, being able to perform better spam protections. Um, in general, yes, if you're, um, if you're trying to protect your metadata from your provider, then this perhaps may not be what you're trying to use, or what, what you need to use, but we wanted to provide something which at, at least can protect your contents, which is what we were really focused on, and provide this to as many people as we can. And so with this update, we were able to ship end-to-end -end encryption as an option to a billion people without them having to do anything, um, which, yes, doesn't protect their metadata, but does give them a significant increase in messaging security. Um, I had a question about the web or the storage uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, encryption. It looked like uh, the key was to encrypt the storage was provided by Facebook. Is, is that, is that um, are you able to be compelled to decrypt the storage on the device then? Or um, I guess I'm not clear on the, why, the, why this choice is made. So I'm probably not the best person to answer policy questions as I, um, I largely handle the technical side of things. Um, so if there were a physical device, um, then like, it would be possible for Facebook to access that storage key. Um, but um, in general, this is, this, attack, this is to prevent the attack where you have a device um, which you know someone else has been using, but are, they're logged out of now. And you, as someone um, without access to that storage key, want to read that, those messages. And it's, so it, it's, to protect, I get, uh, it's, it's to protect against other people accessing your physical device and to raise the bar. Yeah. I mean, I get that. I was just wondering if there was a usability or some other reason for that control of the key by Facebook. But. Um, no, it was, it, it was just, just to raise the bar when, when switching devices. Uh, hi, thank you for this presentation and thank you for rolling this out. Um, I, I agree it doesn't solve all the problems, but I'm happy to see it being pushed into the real world. At least we can raise the bar and um, leave you with some data that you, can, that you don't have immediate access to. Um, if you want to try to solve this, I recommend thinking about mixing the user's password into this. I'm assuming you don't store clear text of the user's password. That's if correct. you mix the user's password into the account key, then you can potentially protect this against both your being able to recover and everyone else. Um, yes, that w so, so that, that could work aside from in cases of, say, account recovery where someone has actually lost access to their password. Um, so Right, so if you're doing this as an optional opt-in thing, mm -hmm. you can say, hey, if you want us to be unable to have access to this, check this extra box during your opt-in. This is just an option for you. Thank you. Thank you. Is it quick? Because we have to actually move on. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, just on the last point about making this work on the web, um, mm -hmm. I, I work on Firefox, so I'm very keen to have this work on the web. Uh, so do you have any thoughts on things we could do to make the web more friendly to this stuff, things we could add to the browser to, to make, make it more amenable to this sort of thing? That sounds like probably a slightly longer point than we have time for, but should we talk Happy afterwards? to take it offline. Yep. Great. Okay, thank I, you. I think we, we should actually move on. So, sure. uh, John, thank you very much. This is a great talk. Thank you. Thank you.